Today, I'd like to talk to you about communicating and leading change. And I'm going to use certain metaphors, which is why this is subtitled Cart Horses, Dancing Elephants and Inverted Swans. Next slide, please. Now, my family's association with the northeast of Scotland began in 1954 when my father and mother, newly married, uh, were posted to Bucky and my father became the employment exchange manager there. And one day, the weekly newspaper in Bucky had a headline that announced that Bucky had a new dust cart. There is a dust cart just like it. Now, a week later, the, um, the story was back in the press again because the horse could not pull, pull the new dust cart in Bucky. And so he was having to continue to pull the old dust cart. The story was back in the paper again a week later because the horse now could pull the new dust cart because the folk at Bucky Town Council had discovered how to release the handbrake. Now, that's a funny story, but equally looking at that through a different lens, this is an organizational change, introducing a new system where there was no training needs analysis done, no training plan, no implementation plan, no project plan, and no equipment manual. So if you think about that, uh, it was bound to go wrong. Um, next slide, please. Because what I've described was firmly Bucky putting the cart before the horse in, uh, in needs terms. Okay, next slide, please. Now, here, every organization, it doesn't matter whether it's public sector or private sector or charitable or anything else, it has mission, goals, strategies, and there is leadership and direction at the top. If there is no strategy, then it does have a strategy which is aimless or random, okay? But of all these things, communication, organization, people, budgets, and so on, the key thing is the mission and goals and strategy and the leadership and the direction and everything else follows. Let me, next slide, please. So it's the decisions that turn that implementation into fact and reality because the leaders make decisions according to that strategy, whether it is explicit, implicit or non-existent and they communicate them to colleagues, otherwise nothing will happen, to direct those efforts and so that everybody is implementing the same strategy. Next slide, please. Now, regardless of your political leanings one way or t'other, um, Tony Benn said a great deal of interesting things. One of his metaphors was, is a politician a weather vane or a signpost? And I apply this to people in business and organizations as well. A weather vane, is someone who waits for the wind to blow in a certain direction before he points in that direction and suggests he should head in it. A signpost is someone who tells you, regardless of crosswinds, this is the direction in which we should be going and I will lead in that direction, come and follow me. And it's just an interesting way of looking at that. And now, obviously in terms of direction, I applaud the signpost more than the weather vane. Let me move on to some examples, and I'm picking these for a specific purpose. Next slide, please. So famously, first of all, Honda, famously, its corporate message was at one time, we don't have to work harder, we have to work smarter. Okay. Fujifilm, their corporate slogan, corporate message at one time was, kill Kodak. However, what I'm interested in is the example, James Burke had a TV series and a great book many years ago called The Day the Universe Changed. And his point was that when certain things are discovered and people could look at the world in a new way, the whole universe changed and it was never gonna go back. And the sort of examples James Burke had in his series were the arrival of Aristotelian logic from medieval Arab Spain, the development of the printing press, 
the study of trajectories that discovered the law of gravity and could allow you to know where an artillery shell would land when you fired it out of your um, out of your gun. Okay, next slide, please. Now, there's a great example here. When Louis Gerstner arrived as CEO of the great IBM Corporation, at a time when IBM was not doing well, he first declared, the last thing IBM needs right now is a vision right now. What he was meaning was some of the dreamy vision statements about pleasing staff and delighting customers and so on, which are all very well. But the time pressures meant that that wouldn't help IBM to get out of the position it was in at that time. So he then declared that IBM had three challenges. One, they had to deliver results. Two, they had to bring in sales. And three, they had to deliver to schedule and to budget. Absolutely clear message, so clear, everybody in the corporation could understand it. And he therefore said, we are gonna focus on four things, execution, decisiveness, simplifying the organization for speed and breaking the gridlock. Because if we don't crack those challenges, we'll be out of work. So it was such a clear message that he uh, decided and promulgated across the huge organization. And indeed, he turned IBM uh, round as that. So that's why he called his book afterwards, Who Says Elephants Can't Dance? And there are my dancing elephants. Let me move on. Next slide, please. Now, first, I'm going to quote the gentleman in the top right there, Daniel Defoe, a famous author. But he once said that ideal English was such that if you spoke to 500 people, that they would all receive the same message and that message would be the one intended by the speaker. That was his definition of the ideal English. So let me take two examples. My diagram of profit is revenue minus cost. In one case, I know the importance, the change that was led and communicated was, the was that the company needed to stop chasing sales and instead chasing sales margin. In other words, it was no use coming back and saying, great news, I've sold a million, uh, but there's very low margins. That was not acceptable. Instead, they had to report how good a sales margin had they got, no matter what. And that change then was driven through the company into operations, into finance, into the commercial department, into the HR and reward systems and so on. And it turned it round. The gentleman in the uniform on this slide is General Sir Nicholas Carter. He's now the chief of the defense staff, but I saw him speak shortly before he became the chief of the general staff, which is head of the army in the UK. And he said there were three planks to what he was going to do. The first was a continuum of persistent engagement. In other words, we're not going to be talking about going to war or ending a war, but there will be engagement in between those levels of like counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, and so on. His second was a people-centric approach, and he did not mean the sort of vision statements of people are our most important resource. What he meant was warfare and defense in the future no longer is about us versus an enemy, but instead you have all these different people in different categories, and they may be journalists, civilians, um, paramilitary forces, military forces, and so on. And we needed his vision. We needed to understand the complexity of that people-centric approach. And his third was a redefinition of division level command. Now, again, those lessons were very clear, change that was communicated such that every soldier should be able to understand the three key messages. So here's a picture of a demonstration in London that's getting out of hand. My question is, 
Is this chaos? Is it ordered chaos? Or is it teamwork? Well, actually, it's a bit of all of those three. Let me explain. I was a special constable for many years. And I remember newly in uniform going to some pub fight and it appeared to me to be complete chaos, nothing going on. Really, what had happened was that I hadn't realized the situation and everything going on within it. And later I realized that the police officers knew that they were an orderly team working inside a chaotic situation. They knew they could rely on their colleagues around them to act in a way which gave them the confidence to act. And I'm taking that lesson into business, that if everybody knows what they are doing, even although outside is chaos, the team know that they can each concentrate on their own job to deliver the results for the company. That was true in my example of IBM. That was true in my example of the army that I gave a few moments ago. So next slide, please. Now, the swan is a famous metaphor suggesting that you need to be calm on top while paddling like crazy underneath. But next slide, please. I'd like to suggest that an ideal situation, the best position to deliver results might be the exact opposite, the inverted swan. In my inverted swan, on the surface, your organization is buzzing with energy. It's seemingly chaotic as people are going hither and yon, and you may not be understanding as an outsider what's going on. But underneath, there is calm order and organization because each team member knows what she or he should be doing. And team members know that they can rely on each other and together all of the staff will deliver the results. And that was true in my IBM example. And it may be, it may look chaotic on the surface, but because the change has been communicated and is being led well, following my metaphor of the signpost, not the weather vane, then the results will flow and everybody will achieve the organization's objectives. Next slide, please. So there's my quick look at communicating and leading change with my metaphors of the cart horses, the dancing elephants and the inverted swans. I hope you found that interesting and I hope you found that there are lessons there for you. Thank you very much.